and Debbie for introducing me. So just very quickly, I'm Abby. Um, I am the SCAD Research Fellow, so I live, dream, eat SCAD, basically. <laughs> um, and um, I'm here, and what I plan to do for the next kind of 15 to 20 minutes is talk to you about anxiety, grief and SCAD, which is one of the topics um, that I won't say I'm an expert in, but I can definitely share what I see from you guys. So hopefully this will be inspirational for both of us. So um, I just wanted to kind of take you through kind of how psychology affects any patient with any cardiac condition. So patients who've had myocardial infarcts or any kind of presentations with heart attacks, we know that there is a common process of bereavement in these patients. Um, it seems to be higher in patients who um, the, the prevalence is higher if you've just had an acute event, so this is out of nowhere. So unlike cancer where it's a protracted process, you get ill kind of within the days or months or years, with heart attacks is a sudden onset. So the prevalence of kind of the psychological impact that has seems to be higher as a result of it. It tends to be commoner in women. So any woman with any cardiac condition is more likely to suffer, to kind of suffer from a psychological issue related um, following, the, um, following a heart attack um, or kind of bereavement or stress as a result of it. Commoner in younger patients, um, I guess that's quite easy to explain. If you're younger, you're fit, you're healthy, um, it's and something happens out of nowhere, it kind of stops you where you are, and that can have a big impact. Um, it can present at any time following the acute event. So, um, you know, some people go, well, I'm actually fine, I haven't had any problems. That's absolutely fine, and we tend to sometimes see people don't present until very late on because they haven't quite gone through the grieving process. So how does that fit in with SCAD? Well, I think all of those points are absolutely applicable to the SCAD patients I see. Um, not being unfair to any men here, but, you know, kind of grieving and kind of the, the whole process happens in both populations. However, it is more common in women and more, women are more likely to be impacted by this than men. And again, we, SCAD patients are a younger population, so they're more likely to suffer as a result of this. So, um, as Debbie mentioned, I think I've seen about probably more than 140, probably a bit more SCAD patients in the country. So, yes, I think I can put myself up in the ranking of I've seen most of the SCADs possible at the moment. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of patients who come to see me or come to the research date or to clinic, so whichever avenue you've come through, um, there is a need to tell your story. And I probably, my opening lines, tell me what happened. I start off with that. Um, I do that partly because I want to actually learn and see what has happened, and through that I'll take you through my journey of what I've learned. But so, sincerely, I, real, I kind of realise that when people do share their story about what happened, whether, you know, what led up to it, what happened during the process, what's happened since, there is a massive sense of relief of let go. Um, and it's partly because um, you've been able to talk to someone about it, who gets it, who's able to kind of give you the time and the confidence to share your story. You're able to share your symptoms and realise that they're all genuine. So for those of you who have regular chest pain, you get, you know, you're going to hospital three times a month because you're unwell. Those are genuine problems. Those are not symptoms that one can disregard. And essentially, it's almost like an emotional roller coaster for someone to sit there through that room, look back at what's happened, to be able to share all their experience of their ups and their downs, and how they've managed to get to this date, which is their research date or their clinical date, to be able to speak to someone about what SCAD means to them. So this brings me to our five stages of grief. And to be honest, all of you look like this when you come <laughs> at, any, at any point of it. So I see some who are in denial, who are, I'm absolutely fine, doctor, you know, I'm great, which is fantastic. It's great to see that. There are those who are very angry and upset because something's happened to them. And why did it happen to me? I'm, you know, I'm fit, I'm healthy, I run around, I do all the right things. Why me? And, you know, that's a common thing that we see. Those who are bargaining with me, well, you know, I'm okay. I'm, I, you know, if I take this, would I be okay? So, <laughs> you know, we're trying to kind of figure out what's going on. And obviously there is the ones that are very tearful when they come. And actually there is a flood of tears that occur, which is absolutely a normal process. And then on the other side of it is those who have come to an acceptance, and that's what we aim for everybody to be in, eventually as part of the process with research, with clinics, to get to that point of, okay, this has happened, what am I going to take out of this as positive and make my life go forward? And that's where we aim to be with everybody. So you're all in that at some point. <coughs> so the common comments that I get, I'm not a mad doctor. No, you're not. Uh, no one believes me. Um, to some extent, it's unfortunate, and actually for me as a clinician to be sitting there and hearing 
what you've gone through, the hospitals you've gone to, the doctors you've seen, and how you've been dismissed. It's, it's, it's alarming and it's quite sad because as a health professional, I would expect my colleagues to be a little bit more aware or actually seek questions and try to find answers for them. Um, and it doesn't happen all the time. And it's not a criticism because this is a rare condition. You know, when I started off and I say this story, I, there were 70 or less people that we knew about who've had SCAD. You know, we did a download of the registry. There's over four, 582 people on that registry. Not all of them are SCAD, but we're approaching 500 patients, and that's just within a two years period. So that tells you that how much awareness there is of SCAD. I don't think the incidence rate of SCAD is high. I just think more people are able to come and register and put themselves forward, and that's the most important thing. So awareness has definitely happened. Then comes the flood of tears at this point. And it's absolutely fine because, you know, it, it's a safe place to release um, all of those floods of tears. And also, I think for those ones who've had that experience, not to be alarmed, you've travelled quite a far way to get to Leicester. I would be very emotional if I had done that. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's absolutely fine. And, you know, and you're not mad. And, you know, but the people that don't believe you is because they don't understand it. And there should be some encouragement. And, you know, this is what we're trying to do as part of research, is to teach and educate our fellow colleagues so that they don't dismiss your symptoms, so that they actually manage it. And when they don't know what to do, it's to contact people that do know what to do. So that's the aim of what we're trying to get to. So um, what, what is the benefits of all of you guys coming to research for you? So, you know, it's a day you kind of talk about what's happened. It's very emotional. Um, you, you know, you kind of realise where you are and what's happened. But actually, the, there has been a lot of literature review and search on, you know, the benefits of patients being involved in research and essentially being involved in something that's quite rare. Um, apart from everything else that you've experienced, I hope it's been positive. Um, there isn't that many nods, but <laughs> anyway, um, you can tell me later. <coughs> that you gain knowledge about your condition. I mean, what we try to do as part of the process is if we've got your angiograms, if we've got your MRIs, just to show you, is to actually visualise what has happened. Because I think that sometimes it's very difficult. You go away, you read a lot about what's happened and, you know, what does it mean and I'm going to have, you know, another SCAD again and if I will, what will that mean and what is actually SCAD? So part of the whole process is education and getting knowledge of your condition. I think when, pa when you guys do it, you can teach others. So you can teach your peers, basically. You can teach your families. You can teach your children. And you, most importantly, teach the doctors that look after you. And actually, I think education of teaching others, particularly clinicians, comes from you guys rather than me. I can sit there and talk about it. But, you know, when you go with a consent form going, look, I've taken part in this research study and this is what I've done, it intrigues them to find out a little bit more or actually question you. And certainly it's through you guys that we get letters from clinicians going, so how do I manage this? What do I do? If it wasn't for you guys doing that and educating your doctors, we probably wouldn't be able to kind of feed back to as many people as we do today. And actually the most important part is you contribute to the outcomes. So whatever we get out of research, whatever that comes out, whether it's psychological, it's physical, it's data, it contributes to the outcomes of this whole study and what we're trying to achieve, which is better management of spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And in essence, that creates a positive behaviour. So this has been seen in lots of studies of patients who've got rare conditions that participate in research, that this generates positive behaviour amongst patients. And that's reflected in very positive thoughts. And essentially, positive behaviour and positive thoughts is a good way forward of going through the bereavement process and the grieving process to be on the other side of this. So what have I learned? <coughs> a lot. OK, <laughs> genuinely a lot. So um, I'm a cardiologist. Um, you know, I put stents into people's arteries. That's what I trained to do. And when I came to do SCAD, that's very different to what I do in my normal day life, which is I go, if, if anything, I kind of stand there and go, I don't think you should be putting a stent sometimes. And that's quite hard for me kind of to take that kind of approach from being, you know, go in, open up, do be a plumber, get out as quick as possible. <laughs> Um, so I've learned a lot from you because when you guys come and see me, um, I guess taking me through your journey is enlightening me to find out what, what actually are the risk factors in SCAD. Being a woman is important, being a man is also very important, um, but also the emotional roller coaster of what's happened before. A lot of you come in and say it was a very stressful period of my life and that certainly is important into what happens in SCAD and also the kind of the emotional roller coaster, the, the kind of the, the symptoms that you experience afterwards is all very important. Apart from getting to facilitate the process to let you have your say and tell me what's happened, is sharing with me 
your symptoms and how that affects you from a psychological and a physical well-being. I mean, I, I don't know if this patient is around. She's not, but she basically, um, some one of you guys came to see me in clinic a few weeks ago, and you know, she she swore that every time she was stressed or angry or upset, she would get chest pain, and that's quite important. Not important because just it's important for you know for me to recognize this but it's important because i need to find a way to manage this and that's the most important part that i get out of it and it tells me that there is an important aspect of stress that contributes to physical well-being okay um, and it allows me to discuss all the options are also in terms of management that's available to you guys so what i tend to do i tend to first reassure you that you're okay okay um I guess um, that's the most important part, is to let you know that actually it's okay and your symptoms are genuine and you know, whatever you're experiencing is what you're experiencing. So one has to listen and realise where we can find um, solutions for it. Um, majority of you, I probably always kind of direct you to Facebook, um, partly not because I'm a social media advocate, kind of I am, but uh, <laughs> partly because I think it's very important to share with others and important to share with the same group of people who've had the same condition. Um, partly because you learn from others, partly they associate with you, and partly if something is positive and worked for them, it could possibly work for you. And that's why I kind of always push you towards Facebook. It's not that I've got any kind of shares or anything in Facebook <laughs> at the moment. <coughs> okay. um, I think, uh, you know, we talk about different types of kind of um, therapy and what could happen, but before I go that, it's trying to avoid the triggers. So for those of you who've kind of appreciated that stress is my t trigger, my tiredness is my trigger, overworking is my trigger is to be able to kind of recognize that through your stories of actually this happens always when this happens and this happens and what can I do to either stop it prevent it or if I have it how do I deal with it with it and that's the most important part of what we're trying to do when we, we when we kind of get get to those places um, other therapies do include cognitive behavioral therapy and counseling but part of that is actually getting you through the breathing process. So all CBT and counselling is, is to let you talk through what's happened and to get you to recognise the different stage you are at and to get you to kind of the acceptance part. Um, and that's important if, if you're not there yet, okay? And obviously comes medical therapy, but I tend to put that right at the bottom if I could, partly because I don't want to medicate <coughs> you guys as, and, and where, where needed and if it's a solution for a short period of time, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I think some people are more susceptible um, to having symptoms that do affect them. And if, it's, you know, if there is something that medical therapy can help with, I don't think that's out of the question. It should certainly be considered. Okay, <coughs> and this is just a little bit of a brief about coping with your symptoms and what happens. We know that over 80% of you, so 80% of everyone sitting in this room will have some symptoms in the first year of their SCAD. It's probably higher than that, and I'm sure we'll find probably it's about 99% actually, and there'll be the one exception. Um, and that's, Im that's important because it just shows that this is not a benign condition. This is not something you go, great, take your tablets, see you later. It doesn't happen. Um, you know, we'll talk about cardiac rehab, maybe with the um, myocardial infarction, that's what we tend to do, but SCAD is a very different condition, okay? Um, we know that patients do have increased anxiety and stress and post-traumatic stress disorders, which are commonly associated in the first year of their SCAD. Um, and particularly, again, in women who are younger, who've got children, because there's a lot you've got to juggle. So you can't just take time out and go, hey, I'm going to go and deal with my scab for a year, and then I'll see you later. <laughs> it's not going to happen, OK? Um, you're going to have to deal with all of life and what is thrown at you, plus scab. So there is a lot to take on, OK? And again, people who are more susceptible to having the symptoms of kind of stress and kind of sadness and depression and post-traumatic stress or those who've had previous history of anxiety. And there's absolutely, absolutely nothing wrong with it if you're more susceptible to something, like I, I, if you're more susceptible to getting um, spots on your face, um, you will just get them when the weather's cold. It's exactly the same thing. So, you know, not to kind of um, discount that and to be aware of it, most importantly. So um, we said earlier the management is reassurance, sound advice, managing your symptoms, um, Letting you manage your symptoms, I think, is more important, to be honest, than me managing your symptoms. And partly for you to kind of take on, okay, I've got this problem, these are my symptoms, I'm recognising this pattern again, what can I do? Can I, you know, go and drink a large glass of wine? Do I go and tell my children to go and hide in a room so I could have some time out? I do it with my son. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but there, there, are, there is a lot. And actually making you in control of your symptoms is the most important thing, basically. And it's part, the whole point of this is to avoid this vicious cycle of your symptoms um, coming on the physical symptoms that impact your psychological well-being. And then you go around in a circle and to be able to break that vicious cycle for those of you who experience that. Um, and for some of you, this has happened, just gone away. And then you find a few, t you know, later on in the life, it comes back again. It's to be able to recognise that. And for those of you who've not had it, I'm not to say, I'm not saying it will happen. It's just to be aware of it if it does happen. And essentially, getting <coughs> you to complete the stages of grief in your own time. For some people, it's very quick. For some people, it takes very long. I don't think it matters where you are. It's just for you to recognise where you are for yourself and to seek help. So I'm hoping by the end of all of that, everyone will be sitting in acceptance with an absolute smile on their face, because that's what we all ought to be. I'm pr pretty much usually in bargaining, by the way, or anger. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, so after all of that, really, um, this is just to finish off, is to kind of just mention that a life-changing event can actually be a very positive one, okay? Um, and this sounds a bit crazy, and you know, you go, well, hang on a second, I've had this and this, and <coughs> this isn't fair. But actually, having gone through what you've gone through, having gone through spontaneous coronary dissection and coming out of it on the other end, can actually have, the, have a very positive impact on your life. It can make you see what's positive and learn what to take the positive stuff and leave behind the negative stuff. And this is something we'll come to later on, which is the post-traumatic growth, which I won't talk about a huge, huge amount at the moment, but to say this is hopefully where everyone should be it, through their journey of SCAD. And share with others as well. That's the most important part. So I'm going to leave you with a very quick quote. Um, so basically, the most authentic thing about us is our capacity to create, to overcome and endure, to transform, to love, and be greater than our suffering. <laughs>